Good morning to you. It is 8.30 on Wednesday, March 29th. I'm Jay Whitehead for Desiree Frazier, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, Republican majorities in the legislature advance new laws that will purge voter rolls. Then, communities impacted by a string of tornadoes look to neighbors and new friends as they begin to clean up and rebuild. Plus, what it was like to experience childhood at the Mississippi State Preventorium. Preventorium. I mean, how, that, how's that? This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Mississippians may soon be required to vote in elections to maintain their voter registration status. Yesterday, both chambers of the Mississippi legislature passed the conference report for House Bill 1310. Under the policy outlined in the measure, county registrar's offices must survey their voter rolls every presidential election cycle. If someone has not voted at least once since the primary election in the previous presidential election cycle, they will be placed on inactive status and sent a letter asking if they still live at that location. Republican Representative Brent Powell of Brandon took questions during an extensive debate on the House floor, including this exchange with Minority Leader Robert Johnson. Your clock starts on the president. This, this will take effect January 1 of 2024. So your clock starts the next presidential primary, which I don't know if it's like ours would be August. So you've got four, four years up until the November election for president. At that point, the clerk would send you a card asking if you want to remain on the roll. You have four years to respond to that card or so up for jury duty, jury duty, go vote in a different election, anything to that matter. So effectively, you have over eight years before you would be removed. But let me understand this. But the only thing that this person has done is not voted. That's the only thing. That's the only reason he's being single out. That is the reason they're sent the confirmation card to ask he, if they want to ma- maintain on the roll. But he had, he's still a, a, a citizen of the county or city. He still lives there. He's a taxpayer. All he did to be put on notice that he may be removed is that he didn't vote. That is one of the triggers to be sent the confirmation card to make sure he still lives at that residence. Yeah, I mean, but what I'm saying is you sent him a confirmation card because all he did was not vote. All, all he or she did was not vote. Correct. That's why so you get the card. The, is, is, you know, you, you, no, no, you can't be left alone to mind your business, vote when you get ready. If you don't vote, at some point, even if it's eight years, at some point, or if it's four years, you're going to get a confirmation card saying you need to tell us whether or not you want to remain on the voting roll. And you're doing that because the only thing they did was didn't vote. Correct. Voters placed on an active status will not be eligible to vote at their precinct and must cast an affidavit ballot. The list also removes someone from the selection pool for jury duty. There are no explicit uh, carve outs for exemptions for military personnel or their families. This criticism from DeKeith or Stamps of Jackson, uh, this criticism from DeKeith or ja- uh, Stamps of Jackson, who is retired military. Does the state of Mississippi also know who is a military dependent? I, not to my knowledge. I, that's a question. I don't have any clue. So, you know, I spent nine years somewhere fighting somebody during my military career. And in those nine years while I was deployed, getting shot at and stabbed, cut, I never thought about voting. I was busy. Yes, sir. So why are we disenfranchising through law military families? This is not about the service member, the whole family. We're not. Because when you're married and you're, and you're in Germany and you're married and you're overseas, your whole family is over there. They're registered voters of the state of Mississippi, and the state of Mississippi has no way of even knowing that they're the, uh, around the world. All I can say is we're doing every effort to add your amendment and get it figured out how to, how to use it. We're, we're, but why we, would you do that before you present the legislation for vote? Because as of now, the Secretary of State does not have that database. And, well, but they are actively trying to figure out that database. I cannot believe that we got a legislature that's pushing forward legislation that's going to disenfranchise military members and their families. And you know they're going to do it. You, you, you just said it's going to happen. Again, that's criticism from DeKeith or Stamps of Jackson, who's retired military. The measure passed the House 72 to 42. A motion to cons- uh, to reconsider was entered. Representative Ed Blackman, a Democrat from Canton, was among the nay votes. He tells our Kobe Vance the bill injects a punitive element into someone's decision to vote. The main thing is that, that voting is, is not a privilege. It's a, it's a right. And uh, one of the privileges you have as a registered voter is not to choose not to vote. And that should not be a penalty to those who, for whatever reason, 
will not vote within a specific uh, time period that's set by the legislature. And to have people have to go through a re what amounts to a re-registration process after they've been registered, uh, they're registered to vote, I think it's punitive in nature, and there's no reason for that other than just being what Mississippi appears to be satisfied with being, a state that has not learned uh, any lessons from its history and past. Uh, it doesn't speak well for the state to have any citizen uh, penalized for choosing not to vote. Why do you think somebody might be unfairly subjected to, to being taken off the voter roll underneath this legislation? Well, I cannot think of any particular reason other than there's a belief that it has a demographic impact that is going to harm one group more than, more than the other, and perhaps they're right about that. And I think that's the only reason to do so. I don't think the majority in this House for one minute would pass any legislation they thought would be harmful to their, uh, their, their voting bloc. So I, my, the only conclusion I've, I've reached is they, they feel and probably like, uh, uh, they're likely right that it's going to affect minority voters more so than it would affect, uh, affect the majority. Representative Summers brought up a point that uh, about people who have access to a mailbox. Uh, do you think that's going to be something we're going to see in the future underneath this legislation? Well, look, look <laughs> there are lots of reasons that people overlook mail. Uh, and one reason that it has an official government uh, designation on, on it somewhere in that, in that left or right corner. And I, I spoke today about my experience uh, in Canton when we had uh, that tactic used to attempt to prevent certain voters from voting simply they did because they did not uh, accept their mail. The mail was returned to the sender. They used that as an excuse to attempt to challenge them at the poll. And obviously at that time we had the Voting Rights Act, Section 5, which protected us, and that's what we used to go to court to prevent that from happening. As you know right now, we don't have Section 5. Uh, so we're going to have to find operate on the Section 2 or just go back strictly back to the 14th Amendment and, uh, and challenge it if we need be in court. Thank you so much for your time. Okay. Representative Ed Blackman of Canton and Madison, and Madison County speaking with MPB's Kobe Vance. Coming up, communities impacted by a string of tornadoes look to neighbors and new friends as they begin to clean up and rebuild. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hi, I'm Jason Klein from Fix It 101. If you ever thought about changing a doorknob or fixing a leaky faucet, some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. Join us each week for Everyday Tech on MPB Think Radio. We have an IT expert, a computer repair ace, and we troubleshoot your problems on the phones as well. Everyday Tech, Wednesdays at 10 on MPB Think Radio. Download the podcast now or listen on YouTube on the MPB Think Radio channel. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. And for Desiree Fraser, I'm Jay White. Communities across the state continue to recover from last week's catastrophic tornado. From Rolling Fork to Amory, Mississippians are picking up the pieces from the battered homes and beginning to rebuild with the help of their neighbors. Some residents of Silver City lost everything in the tornado that swept the Delta. But as Lacey Alexander reports, help is just up the road. Other than a few volunteers and residents cleaning up debris, the neighborhoods in Silver City are quiet and still. But a few miles north in Belzona, their neighbors are welcoming victims and asking what they need. The shelter is set up in a multi-purpose government building and has tables overflowing with water, imperishable food, clothing, and hygiene items. Deborah Giles is the Chancery Court judge for Sunflower and Humphreys counties. She says she's volunteering because her constituents are like family to her, and they need a lot of help to get their lives back on track. It's no one particular thing, but I think what we've seen most is the love and uh, that our community has shown that knowing what people need everything. They're coming out in significant numbers to address those needs. Employees from FEMA were present at the shelter helping victims apply for individual assistance. Waiting in line was Silver City residents Constance Burley, who says both her home and her father's home were damaged by the storms. I think once we get our lights and things back on, um, get back to some kind of normalcy, uh, I think that'll be the first step. And then work on... Um, 
get in my dad's home fixed so that he can live in it, so that it's livable. Back in Silver City, Clinton Jen is cleaning up the debris from his home of over 16 years. He says his community will bounce back like it always does. It'll never be the same, but uh, we the people of Silver City, we've been uh, resilient people, you know. We've been uh, been through uh, things together. We always looked out for each other. It's not going to change now. We're going to look out for each other. We're going to build back. We're going to build back stronger, and it's going to be better. Volunteers say they expect to have the shelter running for the remainder of the week. Lacey Alexander, MPB News. Cleanup efforts continue in Rolling Fork after a devastating tornado wiped out much of the community. Now residents there search for a place to find hot meals. Shantaria Williams waits in a line which nearly wraps the parking lot at Sharky Issaquina Academy. The gym of the school has been turned into a hub for supplies. Residents can make a list of what they need and volunteers piece together go bags, complete with a case of bottled water. Williams is here to pick up a hot meal, hygiene products, and clothing for her family. Late last Friday night, she was leaving work when she got the call. A tornado had damaged her grandmother's home. Her only son, who is six years old, was inside. And though they're all safe now, she says it's been hard to process. I don't like to talk about it because, you know, you get a little emotional and stuff, but we ain't never had nothing like this. I can't say that. So I think everybody in disbelief about this. Destructive storms and a catastrophic tornado cut a path across Mississippi into Alabama, killing dozens of people. Now, the Rolling Fork community and neighboring towns are without electricity or clean running water. The lone grocery store and community health center have been damaged. The town lumber yard was reduced to rubble. All that's left, Williams says, is a Dollar General, a bumper's drive-in, and Rick's Express, a gas station. Though things are grim, the town is not without food. At the academy, Mercy Chefs has set up a mobile kitchen truck fitted with large stoves. Molly McDonald is with a Virginia-based organization and says their mission is to get people fed. Mercy Chefs cooks fresh meals, complete with vegetables and even dessert. When you open that box and you notice it's more than just a hot dog or a sandwich or something cold, It's like nourishing to your soul. You know, it is literally feeding your soul of just warmth and comfort. The trucks have handed out more than 700 meals on this day alone, but they're equipped to deliver thousands more. McDonald says they'll be here all week, and they're in other communities too. Mercy Chefs is delivering meals throughout the region. Ollie Willis, who lives just a couple of miles from Rolling Fork, is volunteering with the aid group. She says it's keeping her from focusing on her heartbreak. I, I come up here to volunteer because I had to, you know, find something to do. I just had to come up here and help my town. She can see that people have been hurt, and not just physically. It's just devastating. I mean, I know after this, I know our communities, some of us going to need some therapy. You know what I'm saying? The kids and all. Back in line at the gym, Williams has gotten her food, but she's still waiting on diapers and soap. Her son clings to her legs. My hope is that we can get everything cleaned up and back together, which I know it'll never be the same, but hopefully that we can get some stuff back the same. But it could take a while. Officials say more than 1,900 homes were damaged across Mississippi. For the Gulf States Newsroom, I'm Maya Miller. The Gulf States Newsroom is a collaboration between Mississippi Public Broadcasting and public media stations in Louisiana and Alabama. Coming up, what it was like to experience childhood at the Mississippi State Preventorium. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hi, I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. On the original Southern Remedy, we answer questions about all aspects of your health and share some of the latest medical information in the news. You can listen to the show on Wednesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your preferred podcasting app. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. And for Desiree Frazier, I'm Jay White. 
In May of 1959, Susan Anna Curry arrived at the Mississippi State Preventorium during an early to mid-20th century. Tuberculosis was one of the main causes of death in the United States. And preventoriums were the type of hospital aimed to ward off tuberculosis in children thought to be at risk to contract it. In her memoir, Curry explores the unique and isolating world she experienced. It's also the subject of this week's History is Lunch at the two Mississippi museums. Curry tells our Desiree Fraser about the sense of community she shared with the other children during her time at the preventorium. Preventoriums were a completely separate medical movement. Um, they were founded in order to help in the belief that uh, sending children who were considered to be in poor health, um, that children were more at risk for contracting TB. So they were designed to help children uh, acquire good health. And the the preventoriums used a method called the fresh air method, which meant that children followed a very rigid schedule and uh, but were outside a lot, fresh air, healthy food, lots of sleep, and a, a wore as little clothing as possible. So the children at the preventorium, not just the Mississippi preventorium, these were all across the United States. It's just that I was in the Mississippi preventorium. Um, but you wore bloomers. Pretty much that was it, uh, unless in winter. We had a little bit more clothing in the winter with um, three-quarter length sleeve sweaters and sneakers, but pretty much the open air method was what was employed to help children sort of build up their physical strength. And what were you no suffering time. from? Well, I had very bad asthma and um, <clears throat> had been in and out of the hospital for most of my fifth of, fifth year of life, and I was very underweight. And that was another thing that was uh, often the case for children at premature, children who were very underweight. So at ages four years old, I weighed uh, probably would have, I mean, excuse me, I went into the preventorium when I was six years old, but I weighed and looked like a four-year-old. I was tiny. And so you stayed there for 15 months. You went in in May of 1959. Was it your parents who wanted you to be there? No, no. And actually what had happened is my father died very unexpectedly when I was four. My mother was very young and she had me and I had an older brother who was two years older and after my father died, uh, it was very hard on her and, and my family. And I began to be, I'm sure there were some emotional issues there, but they didn't think about that in 1959. And um, so I was very sickly. Um, and the doctor made made my mother put me there. She didn't have a choice. How did she handle that? Well, I think it was very hard for her because, you know, she had lost her husband. Not that, you know, she was only 29. She'd lost her husband. and She had a six-year-old and a four, four-year-old at the time he died. And then I became very sickly. And, you know, she she was working, trying to take care of us. And um, so then at, at age six, the doctor insisted that I go to the preventorium. So here she was, one child at home, one child in the preventorium. And I, I think it was emotionally very difficult for her. So this uh, preventorium stayed open until 1976. That's quite a period of time from 1929. And you yeah. talk about it being lonely, but yet it had a sense of community. Well, you know, we were all children. We were, you know, the way I like to describe it is we were alone together uh, because the, it was an extremely rigid routine. Um, and, you know, every minute of the day was accounted for. So you didn't have a lot of time to really connect. There were times when you got to run outside and be on the playground. And so some children managed to find one person, you know, to be friends with. And I certainly did. I had one really good friend, but we were continually mixed up, you know, the order of, you know, where you sat at tables and marching single file in line and in school, there wasn't a lot of opportunity to be in small groups. You know, there was a lot of normal childhood development that was missing. You know, and at the time, the, this was a, you know, there was a belief that this was the best thing for the children. And it was at a time in our country and pretty much worldwide where children's uh, emotional and psychological issues were not as considered as much as they are nowadays. Was it an integrated facility? No, there were not, no integrated facilities in the, in the country. The, um, that's one of the 
um, you know, it was during uh, the early half of the 20th century. And so it was completely segregated. You're going to be talking about your book at the Mississippi Department of Archives and Histories. History is Lunch at the two Mm -hmm. Mississippi museums. What do you want to get across to folks? Well, for me, the important thing, the reason I wanted to write the memoir is because it is a lost medical history where um, children had no choice. And I actually was very inspired to write this, you know, years ago several years ago when I saw children being taken from their families. Children are often taken from their families for what people intend as very good reasons, but the Preventoria movement was later proved to be not good psychologically for children. It, wasn't, it didn't help them to be, and hurt many children, to be separated from their families. And, and also I just found growing up, even in Mississippi, which is a relatively small state, no one had ever heard of the Preventorium. It wasn't something that we ever really talked about. You know, in the 50s, people don't really talk about their emotions and feelings. And so um, we never talked about this in my family, but I kept running into people who had been at a Preventorium. And there's a there's a site about 10 miles away from where I live now here in upstate New York that was a Preventorium. And um, I was inspired to write the memoir because a, a professor at the University of Pennsylvania had written the only comprehensive history of preventorium hospitals. And so I decided you know, that there, the child's point of view needed to be told, and I wanted to write a memoir of my experience. Did it change you in any way? Oh, it changed me in many ways. I mean, there there are good things and bad things. I mean, it certainly improved my physical health, probably saved my life, but it was a very um, alienating and lonely experience because I could only see my mother, my widowed mother, every other month, uh, excuse me, every other week, so twice a month for two hours. And I didn't see my brother for the entire time I was there. So it had a, it had a profound effect. However, it did have some good effects. I learned resilience. You know, I learned self-sufficiency. Um, so I, you know, is it any situation you, there are there are good and bad, and you know the thing about institutions is that I don't believe anybody had any ill will, but we all know that in institutions, bad things can happen. And I have heard from many children who were at the Mississippi Preventorium and others, bad things that happened. And then I hear from children who had a perfectly wonderful experience. So there's a wide variety of experiences. And I certainly witnessed both very bad behavior on the part of the staff and some happy children as well. But the memoir is about my personal experience. Well, thank you so much, Susan Anna Curry. Her book is The Preventorium. She's going to be speaking at the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. History is lunch. We appreciate your time and talking with us. Thank you so much for talking with me. I appreciate it, and I look forward to it. 